So you took a private jet to pick up these organs? I, I, I guess. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back to Sassy with Mickey and Kev. Today we are recording episode five, which is one I'm super excited for. This is questions for a surgeon that you want to ask, but you're a little scared to ask. So to preface, I have not seen these questions and these questions were submitted by all of you guys. So thank you for submitting them. I would like to also thank everybody for watching these episodes. It's been a lot of work to put together, but Mickey and I have had a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. If you have a few seconds, please Please give us five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on YouTube, wherever you all are watching. We highly appreciate that. I like your new headphones, though. Thank you. I put little bows on them. <laughs> but anyways, uh, before we get started, I do want to give a huge shout out to some of our top listening countries. So first up on the list, we have Singapore. Are we really surprised, though? We love you, Singapore. Thank you for getting us to number one on the first episode. That was pretty epic. Some other top contenders include Malaysia. Asia, the Philippines, Canada, USA, and Australia, which I didn't even realize we had any friends in Australia. So that's incredible. I can't wait to visit. I've never been to Australia. Have you been to Australia before? No, but I think the Aussie accent is like one of the cutest things on planet Earth. All right, let's get started. How many questions are there? There's quite a few. So today we're jumping into things that you want to ask a surgeon, but never got the chance to. Disclaimer, this should not be professional medical advice. Is that something I have to say? And again, if you hear any bone chewing noises, that is Lucky Rye doing his daily bone chewing activities. Don't mind him. Should we give him a mic too? Yeah, we should give him a mic. It's like ASMR. Question number one. We're starting off easy and then it gets juicier as time goes on, okay? Juicier? What yes. kind of questions are these? <laughs> what was the first surgery you did slash were a part of? This can be in medical school. First real surgery. I'll talk about the first surgery that I remember. Okay. It was actually a pretty cool story. As a second year medical student, I was able, to, I was part of the transplant surgery elective and part of that elective allowed me to go on these transplant runs which means that if there was some organs that we need to procure for our hospital, the transplant fellow would fly there and we would do surgery and pick up those organs and bring them back to our hospital. So as a medical student, we get called if it's our turn to kind of join these folks. This was during the middle of second year medical school. I got a call saying that, oh, it's your turn. Head over down to the hospital. You're going to leave in an hour and head somewhere. I didn't know where it was, but somewhere in the vicinity of California to go pick it up. Turns out we ended up flying to Las Vegas mm -hmm. and we went to go pick up some organs. The OR and everything was already set up. And this is a patient who had already had an unfortunate brain death. So they're heart and everything was working we had to do the surgery where we open them up and give harvest, it, the, harvest organs. the organs i don't know how to like nicely say this but in these cases the stakes are a little bit less high in terms of the things that need to happen things need to happen fast so we need a lot of helpers so this was the first surgery that i remember like actively participating in mm -hmm. like holding different clamps and like using the cautery device and like that was a really really memorable first surgery did you that... make the first cut or what did you get to do specifically I got to make the skin incision. It's the most intimate incision, right? Because yeah. that's how I think people imagine surgery to be. You open it up, but like everything else is probably more important. But people always think about when you close it, how that needs to look good. When the you, opening when, and the closing. closing. Yeah. But even though the most important part of the surgery is it's like, like the in, the, in the inside. So what organs specifically did you harvest? We took out the liver. We took out the kidneys. We also have to stop the heart, which is crazy. I don't know if this is PG-13 or R, but you have to like clamp the heart and then cut it and then all the blood you have to suck it out so they let me watch the heart stop beating which mm -hmm. is so crazy which is why i think i remember this moment so well so were you able to deliver those organs to your patient or so this already took like 15 hours like from when i started to getting the organs and going back wait so you started in sf and ended up in vegas yeah and then no, and then we went back to sf and then they they have the organs they have like six or however many hours they're like oh do you want to join in on the surgery for like putting them back in and i was like kevin's like i'm tired I'm Tired. I'm going home. Well, it was like I left in the afternoon of one day and I came back like super. It was like the morning of the next day already. Okay. And I had technically class like in a couple hours. But I was like, uh, <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Kevin's like, I have priorities. But, but the residents and the fellows were like the same people that they were like, they kept working. It was really nice of them to take you on the trip. They definitely didn't have to take you on the little well, helicopter. The oh, I, no, it was a 
private plane. Oh, wait, explain that. They chartered a flight. So it was like a little 10 seater airplane. The, so you took a private jet to pick up these organs? I, I, I guess, yes. It wasn't as glamorous as you think, but you don't have to go through security and you can bring water and I guess you can bring human organs. I sat next to the, the box. Wait, did you fly out of SFO or what? Yeah, they have a private terminal for... For organs? No, for private planes. That's crazy. This is the only time I've ever taken a private plane and it was really windy and it's a tiny plane and it was going like, woo. I love turbulence for you. Yeah, but it was like crazy turbulence. Oh my god. Yeah. That's so cool. You are like Grey's Anatomy wanna, in real life. Uh, I guess. I don't think I want to be a transplant surgeon. Good for them. It's a very um, honorable work, but it's a hard work. Sounds like a tough work. life. Yeah. But that was probably the first surgery I actively participated in. Like before you would stand in the back, right? And mm -hmm. then you like try not to touch anything. In like undergrad, I shadowed surgeons and things like that, which mm -hmm. you should do if you're interested in becoming a doctor to see if that's what you're into. But I didn't really. I'd never touch anything this is my favorite question to ask and i still ask kevin this question all the time what do you do if you're mid-surgery and you have to pee do you wear a diaper are there people who wear diapers no you can just scrub out you should do the critical part of the procedure, but you can pause. I guess I'm just confused. Like, can you give us an accurate picture? Because I feel like what we know about surgery is what we see on Grey's Anatomy. Like, is there actually 30 people in there? Is it really that critical? How do you leave to go to the bathroom? Well, I think like big, big surgeries have a lot of people there because people want to see and there's a lot of supporting staff there. Sure. But not everything is like hyper critical. You can always take a pause. And usually like if there's an attending, there's a surgical technician who's helping hand out the instruments and there's mm -hmm. like one or two residents you can scrub out and so there's multiple surgeons doing surgery so if one person steps out it's okay is what you're yeah, saying you, sh you should have one surgeon in the room at all times hopefully hopefully no I, you should have one surgeon in the room the <laughs> anesthesiologist the, is always there wait so i'm so curious when you scrub out and you go to the bathroom i mean peeing takes what 30 seconds you have to do the entire process of scrubbing in again yes. or is it like a modified version no so you have to go wash your hands do this whole, whole scrub thing okay all all over. Let me take. I mean, you have to waste the gown. Fastest I mean, you've gone and gone to the bathroom and come back. How long like does that take? Five minutes. I guess the threshold is as a younger resident or someone who's more junior, you're afraid to miss stuff or you feel like it's bad mm -hmm. etiquette to scrub out, and so you try to hold your pee. And which I probably did more of my intern year and my beginning of my R two year. Have it's, you ever really had to pee and just didn't go pee? I think I did that as an intern a couple times. So they didn't want to miss like a particular part. But if you gotta go, you gotta go. You should prioritize your own bodily function. Like That's your fair. patient would appreciate it too, I think. That's fair. What if you have to do a number two while you're in surgery? I mean, that you can hold a little bit longer. So I don't you just know. Hold it? I mean, depends. I think if you really need to take care of yourself, you should go take care of yourself. Just make sure that you tell people what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If it's a really yeah. critical part of the case and then you need your arms or hands or to do something, you shouldn't just like peace out. Communication is important. No one's going to tell you no to go to the bathroom. I guess it's much less critical than the TV shows make it seem because it seems like something is constantly blown blowing up in the tv show no so. it's calming a lot of the times like you you just go through the steps and you're looking for anatomy and structure it's not like everything is always blowing up right? interesting like interesting. it's like art speaking of that so during the surgery are you guys listening to music in the or what kind of music are you listening to is there a hierarchy for who gets to decide the music for the most part there is music there are some cases where the patient is not knocked out completely like they're under sedation then we may hold off on a little bit where we may play music more softly but you know it's like any workplace you're concentrated so you can play some background music and people have different things that they want to play i mean unless it's like really really critical and we need to hear like the instruments or something we'll turn the volume down or turn it off for the most part in general there is music playing and the music hierarchy often is the attending the person who's in charge of the surgery because their mood is the most important and if music music is good and it's whatever they listen to then the mood is good so everyone's happy sometimes they'll delegate and it's kind of dangerous right they're like oh chief resident what should be music should be play and then you just gotta gotta know what they like and play it like you, you can't be playing like top 40s for like some of these attendings you know do you listen to songs with bad words in them in the or like swear words yes i mean are they you explicit know, you just play the spotify or pandora playlist are there instances where there's like curse words i'm yeah, just so curious i mean curious. it's just regular it's whatever you like listen to on the radio when you're like driving have you ever gotten the chance to pick a song that you wanted to listen to the funny thing is there's 
there's some quirky attendings. Uh, I, I haven't actually known this firsthand, but someone else told me at the end of the case, it's called closing. Like all the surgery is done and all you need to do is put the tissues back together again. When that happens, usually it's for junior residents or like even medical students because it's just like working on suturing. The critical parts of the case are done. So you get to just put the patient back together. Mm -hmm. And the timing of that usually takes a little bit longer because they're more junior, right? Right. So some attendings will have closing music. Like one of the attendings, the urology attendings will play Despacito and you have to like finish before like, the, before song, the ends. song is over. Or there's like some certain expectations of how long it takes. That's you know? so stressful. I don't think I would do well under no, pressure but in like, that situation. You should take your time and make it look nice. So you've never gotten the chance to pick a song yet? I mean, I guess. You just pick a playlist usually. When you're scrubbed in, you can't like skip the song or anything, right? You can't touch anything. There, however, is a nurse in the room called the circulating nurse in mm -hmm. every operating room that is not scrubbed in who can change numbers on the instruments or grab more equipment. Mm -hmm. And they, they're like in regular clothes and they can change those things up. Just to clarify, I just want to let you guys know who are the critical mm -hmm. people in the operating room. So I think there's five people minimum. So there's a circulating nurse, the nurse that's in charge of the operating room. They get the phone calls, they get all the stuff and they're not scrubbed in. Mm -hmm. There's an anesthesiologist. That's the person that's in charge of the patient's sleeping and all the other drugs. There's a surgeon who's the attending surgeon who's doing the surgery per se. Most of the time, there's a surgical technologist who is this person assisting all the instruments, doing all that work. And then the fifth person for me, usually at my institution, is there's a resident who's learning how to be a surgeon. So in How operating, to be a surgeon. How to be a surgeon. So if you had to choose one song that you could play in the OR, what would be your top pick? Probably just put Taylor Swift on. Are you a Swifty? Yeah. I'm going to their concert. Yeah. We got those very highly coveted tickets, yeah. which tea about those tickets coming next time. Coming next time. <laughs> what What's your favorite Taylor Swift song? That's a tough question. I like the one. I like the older Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. like before 1989. I like Teardrops on My Guitar and like You Belong With Me. The classic. Oh, the classic 15. He's well versed. Well -versed. He said fearless. I, I'm so bad at <laughs> lyrics though. Like Kevin knows no lyrics. I'm like, da, 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 da. are we going to get demonetized? We're no. going to get demonetized because you're singing so good. <laughs> Craziest patient story post anesthesia. Craziest? A funny story pre anesthesia. Go ahead. Or they, I mean, they already had some medication then. They get a little bit of like cocktail stuff before they go into the operating room. This old lady, this I was an intern. This old lady was getting some hernia surgery. Mm hmm. And she was very lovely and the, she's very talkative. And then after she got her meds, she got a little sleepy. This was a robotic surgery case. She was so keen on seeing what the robot looked like. Like she made it sound like it was a person. For some reason, I wheeled her into the case. Normally, it's not me who did that. But I wheeled her in and I'm, she's like, where's the robot? And I'm like, it's right there. It looks pretty intense. It's got like arms that stick down. And if you've never like seen it, it's quite impressive. And so I like wheeled her close to it, but I can't like have her touch it. She's like, wow, technology is so amazing. Aww, like this is, so this thing is going inside me and saving my life. That is so cute. It was, I don't remember all these stories, but she was just very impressed. Oh, that's so it. cute. Is it true that some surgeons will get angry and throw instruments in the OR? Yes, not me. I'm not senior enough to do that. But, you know, things get pretty tense sometimes, right? It's someone's life and not everything happens perfectly. Like, they'll be frustrated like, this is not where it needs to be. I don't have the right instruments. Like Residents are obviously learning and like a lot of the times the staff is also learning, right? And sometimes, no offense, I feel like surgeons are not the most patient people sometimes rightfully so i mean you guys have gone through so much training so much hardship you almost feel like you deserve to have everything finally beautiful at that point in your life but it's also like culture i think a lot of the newer attendings are it's just the way that they're trained in some ways the old school guys yeah where it's acceptable to do that like it certainly doesn't help it doesn't make your day go any smoother if you know it just terrifies like, everybody else it in just the room. makes everybody's mood kind of bad yeah i think it's getting better we have a lot of training not anger management training but like <laughs> wellness and personal just I see. Th like we have those trainings and I think it's been helpful but I think it's interesting to say that some surgeons are very different in the operating room than they are in like real life once they get in that room so it's it just like something just switch turns on or off and they become they just, a different person yeah it's very weird I think I'm pretty similar but like some people like either crank up their personality times 10 or they're just very tense or timid but it can be yeah. a combination of those things and these can be people who are super friendly in real life you would never even guess. I do think though the type of person who has the persistence and the personality to want to be a surgeon though I think kind of you know you are setting really? yourself. It, do you think I could 
be scary for people who don't know me? I don't think you would be scary or mean, but I could see you losing your patience a little oh. bit. I don't think you would throw anything in the OR. And anytime anyone has thrown anything like at me or around me, it's terrified down, right? me. Yeah. I like shut down because I don't know what to do. But I think we're both still young enough where we are still around that enough where we know not to do that to other people because it feels horrible when it's done to us. I think if I'm teaching someone and they're not up to par with what they're doing, I could probably be pretty harsh. I think I you think. would raise your yeah. voice. I don't think you would yeah. do anything like aggressive or anything. Yeah, but... I would probably be disappointed dad. Yeah, you know? disappointed dad like, kind well, of vibe. You should, you should probably go home and practice that like sort of thing. Or like <laughs> That's way more piercing to me than really? um, throwing instruments. <laughs> I don't want that. What was the longest surgery you were ever in? We started around 7.30 and probably finished around like 2 a.m. How long is that? I don't even know how to do that. What is math. it? Like 5 plus 12 plus 2, 17, 19. 19 there's, hours. There's, we have notorious cases that we know that went on for more than 24 hours. What the frick? I mean, I took two breaks. I took a break at like 2 or 3 p.m. and took a break around like 8 or 9. Oh, every time Kevin goes into surgery, I have to really applaud you. You always text me before to let me know you're going in for surgery, like what kind of surgery it is and how long it's going to take. I don't necessarily tell you what kind. I'm just like, oh, this is going to be a long one. I'd be like... Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that though because a lot of people tell me that like oh I'm dating a resident but I don't get any communication from them and you know I'm doing I know they're doing surgery and if Kevin can take three seconds to text me and be like hey I'm gonna be busy for the next yeah, or 12 you, you hours don't, you don't have to say how long you're like hey I have surgery today I've asked Mickey to page me sometimes because yes can we talk about room. that so you've asked me to page you a handful of times in the, while you're in the operating room yeah well if I get paged the nurse I was like hey can you please answer that and then you can either scrub out or you can call back like if there's an urgent message or for a patient on the floor that you need to take care of then you have to take care of that and as a junior resident you're often holding the consult pager mm -hmm. so you have to take care of those things in addition to being in the operating room do you ever feel grossed out in the or or not as much because everything is more controlled but i've definitely had patients who i've been grossed very out grossed, by. grossed out by wait i have a wonderful story about this actually you go go ahead because when i was in nursing school you really don't get any exposure to or nursing or even minor procedures that like might happen and, you know, only if you catch them at the bedside, coincidentally, you'll be able to see them, but there's no specific training for it. But I had the really cool opportunity because I was volunteering in the neurology department to watch muscle biopsies being taken. And this specific muscle biopsy was being taken. It wasn't like a full OR, but it was like an ASC, a surgery center so the room, basically. Was awake. And the patient's awake, it's like local numbing, and it's being taken from the hamstring. And the muscle, if you've ever seen like a picture of a muscle and anatomy textbook it's it's like well, it's juicy like the, it's, it's just like tender. the meat you know? it's Beef. meat it's like the wagyu it's like meat that you see at the supermarket yeah except it was meat on this man's leg and i was watching the procedure and it was so cool it's the first time i like had the chance to watch something like this and i was hot like i was wearing scrubs and i was wearing like a fleece jacket and it was my first time watching this and i walked in the room i was watching in the back you know trying not to touch anything and he wasn't fully numb so he could feel the pain and as they were kind of like testing to see if he was numb, you could see the entire muscle like flinch every time. And then I started feeling really, really hot and you I fainted. went into shock. You yes, fainted. I fainted. But the best part about my fainting was that I did not faint into the sterile field, but I did first faint backwards. So I hit my head on the wall first and then I hit my head on the ground. So I hit my head twice and got a concussion. When I woke up, I was on a gurney and there was five nurses and like people and text around me someone was taking my blood sugar someone was handing me like orange juice or like asking Best me like place to do faint. you know where you are like do you know what year it is and i'm like i'm fine i'm fine i'm AO times four like it was just really hot in there and then i ended up going to the emergency room to get it all checked out because i was very concussed because of that i was convinced that i would not be able to deal with like super gross situations but i actually work in a setting where i do see quite a lot of stuff and before i started this job i was really worried that I would have the same experience, but it has been fine since I've grown. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I want to talk about how common it actually is to faint sometime during nursing school or medical school. It is much more common than you think it is. If not a full faint, like a little blacking out, feeling a little weird. It's pretty notorious in like L&D when people are giving birth. The first like time the you dad. watch that, it's like pretty. The dad. Oh yeah, the dad too, but also for students watching, like it's a pretty it's intense pretty, experience. Yeah, by Biology is pretty gross. It's a miracle of life. It, it is intense though. So you've never fainted or blacked out? No, I've like almost fallen asleep. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> well, like sometimes when you're like standing there for a long time, you know, when your like brain just shuts off for a second, yeah. and you catch yourself. Yes, that happens all the time. So Kevin has learned how to fall asleep. No, meditate, meditate. <laughs> Sorry, meditate with his eyes open. Dang. I don't even know if my eyes are open. So as a junior resident, are you literally just standing there holding stuff a sometimes, lot of the time? Sometimes for a couple hours. So you meditate during those times. Well, you have to look and like move the stuff around, but there not everything is the critical parts of the case. Do your right? arms not get sore doing that? Yes. Sometimes I, I assist in procedures that are usually like an hour long and my entire back is like cramping up. My joints are like it's need not to be a, popped. Yeah, especially when you're like newer, you don't spend time to like, take care of your ergonomics. But the longer you are, like you should, you can move the patient up in the bed or. So. But the height of the bed is always adjusted for the attending surgeon. So well, sometimes so like we have attendings who are like really short, like, so, like a female attending who's like five foot one. Right. And then we have a the, resident who's like six, five. No, no, no. So the issue is that when the attending surgeon is super tall, everybody else got steps has to get on stools. But when the attending is super short, a nice attending will herself or himself will stand on the stool so yeah. that everybody else has a proper height. Or you can be but. a passive aggressive resident who's tall and just sits down. <laughs> Have you ever watched somebody make a mistake in the OR? Yeah, mistakes happen in the OR all the time. I mean, small mistakes, things like, oh, there's a vessel there and you, you, you accidentally, accidentally cut, nicked it. Nicked it. I mean, it's fine. You just have to fix it. Cauterize right? it. Cauterize it or you got to tie it off, right? But then you just have to deal with the bleeding. And Have you ever had a bad experience with OR teammates? Yeah. Spill I mean, it's tea. just like work. There's personalities that work for each other. There's people that don't. Are there people you like see or in the OR and you're like, oh, that's so annoying. Sometimes, yeah. Wow. I mean, there's sometimes the nurses, like I have to hold the pager. They don't help. Like when I'm in the case, I want to learn about the surgery, right? And yeah. They don't like help answer your pages or triage things and they just keep bothering you. So you just end up not actually doing the surgery at all. That's kind of annoying. When I'm on call and we have to do emergency surgery, the nurses that are also on call aren't necessarily the ones that are that know how to do the procedure that you want to do. Sometimes they just are not helpful at all. They're like, I don't know how to do this case. You set everything up. I'm like, this is your job. Like you're on call too. Like you have to figure it out. So yeah. or like work together to figure yeah, it out. Right. But I think there's a lot of people who look down on residents yeah. and think that this is your job to work 80 hours a week. So whatever you're here, you work. But yeah. I think that's a wrong mindset to have. Also, right? I think some people have the mindset that they want to learn. They want to help. Right. Like if they don't know how to do something that they're they're, they're willing to they're learn. willing to learn or just try to like help out in the best way that they can. While other people are like my least favorite phrase is I'm uncomfortable doing this or I haven't been trained enough to do this. A Wait, that's bit. exactly what I was taught to say, though. So that's that's what I'm most frustrated about, I think, and sometimes in terms of nursing and being a doctor. In my full defense, though, we are trained to stay within our scope of practice and I'm not going to do anything that's going to put me on the line or my license on the line. And I understand that in residency, you guys are required to do everything and more. Like I'm willing to help like, and learn if it's safe. But, if but it's how do you unsafe, know if it's, but what if it's something that needs to be done? Right? Like what like, are you asking to do? Let's say I want to do a bedside <laughs> procedure and I need someone to help me. Sometimes I've never done the procedure at bedside and I have to do it. And some, the nurse but is like, that's a residency. Well, why is that different? It's well, different because we have unions and we are protected. See, that's I would rather speak up and say that I'm uncomfortable because I don't want to compromise patient safety is if there's somebody better. But if you don't do it, the patient will not be but if there's somebody better to do it like the other better person should do it what's right? the better person like if i just need a hand to do something if you need me to just help that's fine but if you need me to do the actual well, no thing, i would never like... ask you to do the actual thing <laughs> okay. but I, I i've often received <laughs> like no support even worse they're like you can't do this at bedside or something and it's like hindering care i have to do a lot of things i'm not comfortable doing yeah on day-to-day -day basis which is kind of the i think is the most stressful that's like part the premise of being of residency. yeah you have to do a lot of things for the first time you have to learn how to do it in a safe way but also know when to ask for help but yeah. it's, it's a very tricky scenario in residency a lot of times it's in the middle of the night and you have no support i think i yeah. hear both sides of the argument and everybody's threshold is a little bit different in what they judge to be safe and what they're comfortable with it'll be the same situation and multiple nurses will give you multiple different answers and i think i think that's, that's what's frustrating like depending on the day it's yeah. different even though they're like we are following protocol but i'm like what's the protocol if someone else is okay with it right? i hear you but, but you're like a problem solver you are willing to just step in and solve the problem 99 yeah, percent of the time yeah i guess i just feel sometimes that other people are not 
putting patients first, which is what I'm frustrated about, which is yeah. fine, right? It's just, it's a job. I hear you. Yeah. I understand both sides of the argument. Yeah. And I think I've been on both sides where I'm like, I don't yeah. know. It's a tough question. Do you have any final words for somebody who might be an aspiring surgeon or any last insights or tea? I don't know. I think sometimes there's just workplace culture, you know, so in the operating room, everything blue, you're not allowed to touch because it's like the sterile stuff. There's different expectations, I feel like, of how of breaking of, sterility, of breaking sterility. <laughs> and depending on the case, some cases like need to be really sterile and some cases do not. But depending on where you are from when you are a medical student up to being the attending, basically the surgical, like the nurses and the staff are watching you, making sure you don't touch anything. It was really comical when you first learn how to put on your gloves and gowns. It's like a dance mm -hmm. that you have to do and it, it's still pretty awkward sometimes but you know the very very first time i was doing the dishes the night before a pyrex exploded on my exploded on me and i had a cut on my finger that was like pretty big i just had to, under a band-aid and it stopped bleeding but once i started scrubbing in it just started bleeding what? went into the operating room and my hand was bleeding, was bleeding. or I, I put my gloves on i was like oh, i hope no one notices and then like it didn't feel quite right the scrub nurse put it like the the glue like the skin glue the glue she, stitch <laughs> oh she glue stitched it for you that's she, so no, sweet she didn't glue stick it she literally glue stick my entire finger for those for who don't know it's literally like super, like, it's literally super, it's glue. super glue for medical purposes but i couldn't bend glue. my finger but it's fine you're it's a fine student. i'm not you're doing, not doing anything. anything i'm just <laughs> sweating in my hands and sometimes holding something everyone was laughing really hard about I, would that. Laugh I was like oh my so god i can't hard. be a surgeon anymore this is so ridiculous <laughs> that's the end of the episode yeah. do you want me to conclude there yes please do Okay, number one, don't take yourself too seriously. It's a long road to learn. If something doesn't turn out well, you'll have plenty of opportunities to learn things again. And everyone's learning at their own pace. It's okay for you to make mistakes, but make sure that you understand the risks and like ask for help if you need to. It's a wonderful privilege to be able to get the permission to operate on these folks. You yeah. see them in a very vulnerable spot. They have no control over their bodies at that point. They've given complete trust to you. Give them your, your utmost attention, uh, utmost attention and, care. and care. And that's how I think you should think about it. Oh, that's so cute. It is cute. I don't know. Am I being too serious? I'm very proud of you. You make me so proud. Like at home, at work, I know that you're always doing the most and what is best for your patients. And I deeply admire that about you. Thank you. Yay. I think everyone should have a similar mentality. Thank you for listening to the episode. Don't forget to rate the podcast five stars if you enjoyed it. It takes only three seconds. It would help us out immensely. And we will see you guys next week. Mm -hmm.